Hi guys, hi, my name is Josiah. I'm the really mentors, I guess. And today we're going to talk about biomedical engineering. So, who can tell me what the picture on the front is, or what do you think the picture on the front is? Yeah, go ahead. E. coli, not quite. No. Some people already spotted the hint. Tuberculosis. Right, great, cool. This is the hint right here. You guys didn't notice. This is the source right here. So, this is what we think tuberculosis looks like. It's a, we think it looks like this. It looks kind of sausage like. Anyways, as you can tell, we're going to talk about my presentation today. It's going to be about uh, tuberculosis and about how biomedical engineering applies to that. So, let's start off with what biomedical engineering is. So, perhaps some of you have some idea what university is like, and, uh, but today I'm going to focus a little bit more about what would you do with a career in, say, biomedical engineering. So, biomedical engineering is applying engineering principles and design methods to biological and health concepts in order to develop applications for healthcare. So, what does that mean? It means we're applying engineering uh, design, so we're applying design with physics in mind, and we're going to apply that towards biological and health objects, <coughs> devices. So for example, we have things like prosthetic limbs, we have pacemakers, we have MRI machines, CT scan machines, and we have detection devices. And in my case, we're looking at small, portable detection devices. <coughs> so, from this uh, presentation, I'm hoping that you guys will have learned something by the end. So some of the objectives I have is that you'll learn to know the difference between active versus latent tuberculosis. That you'll be able to tell what is DNA if you guys don't already know. And that you guys will have some idea of what devices and biomems. So, biomems, uh, MEMS stands for Microelectromechanical Systems. You guys probably don't know what that means, but that basically, what that field is, has to do with all the chips in your phones that you guys are carrying around. Biomems applies these fabrication techniques, we apply them to biological systems or for in our case, health systems. So, who knows what tuberculosis is? Shout it out. Killed Chopin. Sorry? Killed Chopin. Killed Chopin? No. I don't remember Killed Chopin, but I'm sure it's killed many famous people. What, well, what do you know about tuberculosis? What else? Anything. It's a lung disease. It's a lung disease, primarily in the lungs. Right, what else? What else do you guys know? Thank you guys. It looks like a sausage from earlier. What else do you guys know about it? Anything. Do you guys hear anything about tuberculosis? Do you guys know anything about it? Not too much, eh? Alright. <clears throat> well, we'll start with the definition. Tuberculosis is a bacteria that primarily resides in the lungs, in the uh, alveoli specifically, but it can also reside outside of the lungs, like in your kidneys or uh, in your nervous system, or and there are different types of tuberculosis. But today we're going to focus specifically on tuberculosis that resides in the lungs. <clears throat> oh, that's a preview. <laughs> so who knows how tuberculosis is spread? Any ideas? <laughs> what did you see that? <laughs> Coughing, right. It's transmitted through airborne by airborne. So tuberculosis, as we're seeing, it's a bacteria that resides in the lungs. So as Illustrating this diagram, what happens is tuberculosis bacteria, when you guys cough, it resides in the small droplets that you cough. And so let's say if you cough and you don't cover your mouth, <coughs> if someone breathes in those vapors, you're breathing in the small droplets with the bacteria into their lungs. And so then that person is considered to have tuberculosis at that point. I thought it was kind of cool. So continuing with on what tuberculosis is, we'll talk about a little bit how it interacts with our bodies. So tuberculosis bacteria, what, what happens is that it is a bacteria, what happens is our immune cells, when it identifies normal bacteria, it comes in something called uh, macrophages, they come and they engulf it, and they try and break it down. But because tuberculosis bacteria has this protein coat, or this like shell, on the outer shell, the, our immune cells can't break it down. And so what it does, it just kind of tries to eat it and sends more of these immune cells that come and try to attack it and try to eat it. And pretty soon, you get this like super big immune cell 
and it's called a granuloma. And what it does is it prevents the bacteria from actually interacting with their body. And that's a good thing, because then it's not actually harming our body. So this is a uh, cute little diagram of something called phagocytosis, where the immune cells can engulf or envelop or eat up the bacteria normally. But because again, 2B has its protein code, you can't break it down. So, talking more about the, the problem, this is going into our first learning objective to tell the difference between latent versus active tuberculosis. So, coming from the last slide, we know that the immune cells are actually preventing the bacteria from interacting with those of our body, right? That's considered latent tuberculosis. Because it's preventing the bacteria from interacting with their bodies, it means that we're not actually, you're not actually contagious because every time you cough, the bacteria is not inside those droplets that you cough because, again, it's walled off. That also means that it's not interacting with the rest of our body, so that means we're not showing physical signs or symptoms of having the disease. But because uh, your immune cells have interacted with it, it has specific immune cells are trying to attack it. So when you do something called a skin test, and maybe you guys have seen it before, but we'll talk about it later, you'll test positive for tuberculosis. On the other hand, for active tuberculosis, this is, what happens is that uh, active tuberculosis is defined by bacteria, or by the immune cells not, able, not being able to wall off bacteria. So if you imagine, for example, people who have uh, HIV or AIDS, or people who are much older and the immune system is not working, what happens is that the, the immune cells are no longer able to contain the bacteria, and so at that point in time, it's, it's able to come out of the granuloma and interact with the rest of our bodies. That's when you start showing signs and symptoms of uh, having TB. So you have night sweats, you have chills, you have loss of appetite, and you'll lose weight subsequently. Also, because it interacts with the rest of our body, it'll actually be in the small droplets that you cough up. So that way, you're considered contagious. And again, because you have immune cells that are, are interacting with the tuberculosis bacteria, you'll test positive for the skin tests. Interestingly, the World Health Organization, which you guys have just learned and did an activity with, they estimate that one third of the world's entire population has a latent form of tuberculosis. And if you think about that, that's pretty insane. Like, that's every one in, about one in every three people in the entire world's population has tuberculosis. Granted, it's more concentrated in certain areas than other, but that's a lot of people that have latent form of tuberculosis. Also, again, as we're saying, going from latent to active tuberculosis, the World Health Organization also estimates that about throughout a person's lifetime, they have a 10% chance likelihood of forming active tuberculosis from latent tuberculosis. If you have HIV or AIDS, they have a 10% chance likelihood of forming active tuberculosis every year that you're alive. Again, going back to the fact that the immune cells aren't able to effectively wall it off. So, let's talk about why, you might be asking, why are, why are you trying to uh, detect it? Or my purpose is to detect it. You might be wondering, why am I trying to detect it? Why not try and cure it? That's because there's already a cure out there. It's been a cure since the 1940s. It's called a streptomycin. But the thing is that uh, because TB has become so resistant to that, most medical <coughs> providers don't actually consider that a viable treatment. So they've come up with other treatments like um, rifaxin or isoniazid. These are just drugs that they use nowadays. Also, is uh, we're looking at trying to detect it because in order to eliminate a disease, there are two things you have to do. First, you have to detect it. And then second, you have to eliminate it by curing it. So what we're doing is we're trying to do the first step where we're trying to Act, uh, actively detected. Now, what happens right now in third world countries is that because they don't have uh, lots of money to go to lab that hire uh, expensive labs or they don't have a lot of expensive equipment, uh, they do something to detect tuberculosis by putting it on a petri dish. It looks something similar to uh, these small petri dishes right here. And they just grow bacteria on here. And they determine to see whether or not you have tuberculosis growing. But because tuberculosis doubles every 20 hours, whereas E. coli doubles every 20 minutes, it takes about two to six weeks to make an accurate test. And if you think about it, if 
do. If someone, has, if someone travels far away, they get tested, and they go back, wait two to six weeks, they come back and they find out they're positive for tuberculosis. The entire two to six week span, they're talking to the parents, they're talking to the children, uncles and aunts and co-workers, maybe talking to you. The entire time they're transmitting tuberculosis bacteria to you, you can see from this activity you guys just did, uh, if one person has it, patient zero, right? Transmits it to one person. And if we were to continue on, you can think about it. If I transmit it to you, you transmit it to two people, those two people transmit it to other people. It's exponential in terms of the number of people that are affected. So we're trying to develop a small biodetection device that you can take to these places and detect it within the same day, and maybe a couple hours. And so that way, when a person comes, they come and get tested, they can get treated that same day, whereas normally they would have to go wait two to six weeks to spread it to everyone around them. Also, because we have drug-resistant tuberculosis, becoming a, uh, a rising threat. The World Health Organization is quite afraid of this because I think they say that the estimate about 5% uh, of TB cases are drug resistant, meaning the drugs we use aren't effective. And you can think about that, meaning you're trying to fight a bacteria without guns, like trying to go into war without any weapons. It's kind of suicidal, right? So we're trying to detect tuberculosis bacteria, not only if they have it, but what strain they have so we can treat them with the right type of uh, drugs that we can effectively kill it off. So we're going to talk about some detection methods. Earlier I said about skin detection, right? So perhaps some of you have had skin, uh, a skin test before. Uh, you guys, have you guys had skin tests before or no? Essentially what happens is, like in this diagram here, or this picture here, you've got a small needle that inject a little bit of protein derivative, so that it's protein. And what happens is that if your immune system has come in contact with tuberculosis bacteria before, it starts mounting a defense. So it comes and tries to uh, attack this. And that's and at that point that point in time, on your skin, you'll see this bump on you. And that's and the healthcare providers will be able to tell, yes, you have come in contact with tuberculosis, or no, you haven't. So this is more of a screening test than it is anything. It's quick and cheap, but it doesn't tell if you have tuberculosis only if you come in contact with it. Something else is we also use uh, sputum smear microscopy. That's where we take a person's like, like sputum, which is like a, you can think of it like mucus that comes from the lungs, and we put it on like a microscope slide, we tag it with some fluorescent stuff, and we look under a microscope, and we see if we can see it if it emits light. If it does, then you're considered to have tuberculosis. Something else is we use blood tests. In blood tests, we're specifically looking for something called to interfere on gamma cytokine. So cytokines are used for met they're like messenger molecules. They go, they tell like the macrophages, the immune cells, hey, we've got something here that's not good for our body, come and attack. So we're looking for the specific one called interferon gamma, which indicates that you have tuberculosis. But what I'm interested in, what my group is interested in, is using and manipulating nucleic acid amplification tests, which is where we use DNA, tuberculosis DNA, and we, and we determine whether or not someone has tuberculosis by looking to see if they have that tuberculosis DNA inside their bodies. So, now we get to a little bit more about science-y stuff, about what my stuff is, about what my project is. It's on detecting tuberculosis using electrochemical molecular beacons in an isothermal microfluidic chamber. <laughs> so who knows what that means? Who understood about like 10% of what that means? 5%. 5 1 5%. Alright, somewhat, somewhat. There. What did you notice? 1%. All of The beacons. You saw channels. Oh, you saw channels. Yes. Exactly. Alright, what this all what I'm trying to indicate here is that it's a very interdisciplinary kind of field. You have things like chemistry going on. You have to know some chemistry, you have to know some biology, you have to know some physics, and you have to know some microengineering. And this is just to say that in general, biomedical engineering is a very interdisciplinary field. You have to know a little bit of each of these sciences. And what happens is you synergize these different fields into making some kind of device where normally you wouldn't be able to make it as effectively in one single field. It's really fun, it's really challenging, but it's extremely warm. It's a, it's a, I think, personally, if you, if you love science and you like, you like the different sciences, biomedical engineering is something you want to do. It's really rewarding. You can, 
hopefully, ideally, when we make this device, it can impact millions of lives. So, this is going on to our second learning objective. What is DNA? So who knows what DNA stands for? Go ahead. Uh, say it. Say it. Yeah, it goes around and makes proteins. Yeah, it's the, the template. Yeah, what, else, what, is it, what does DNA stand for though? Who knows what DNA? Go ahead. Awesome, wow, you guys are smart. <laughs> oh, yes. Wait, first of all, what, Emily, what, uh, what grades do we have here? We have like people from grade 8, grade 8, grade 9, 10, 11, 12. No? Okay, alright. So, most, when did you, you guys learn about DNA? Grade eight? Grade eight? Grade nine? All right. So we have some idea what DNA is, right? Okay. So, stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Good job. <laughs> and for everyone else who whispered. So what are? So then, if you guys know a little bit about DNA, what are these? What are the letters used in the sequences of DNA? R, 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 R. Wait, hold on, hold on. How about someone raise their hand this time? I was trying to choose someone else who has, you guys have answered a lot. Who else, who else knows what letters? Let's hear people from the back table. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. And me, which means A. Yep. And 13 means And also, USL. Okay. I know that's a That's okay, here, we'll, go, we'll keep going. Yeah, go ahead. A, C, O, T. Almost, you got A, C, and T. Yeah, you, one more. A, C, D, G. Sorry? G. G, yeah, right, right. So you got, right, you've got A, C, T, and G. I got one. The U, you go, U is not with DNA, it goes with RNA. So you're close. So, uracil. Uracil, uracil goes with RNA. So you got adenine, cytosine, thymine, and guanine. Right, so who knows what DNA what DNA looks like? What's, what kind of structure? Is it? You got this thing going on. What's this? What is this? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, I think it's a uh, helix. A helix, right, right. What kind of what kind of helix? Someone said here, but it's double helix. Spiral. Sorry. Spiral. What else? Double. double. You said? Yeah, exactly. Double helix. Exactly. So we got A T C G. And it's double helix. A's and the T's go together, and the C's and the G's go together. So that means whenever you see an A and you see a T, they'll want to bind together uh, because, because of the relationships. Oops. So, going on to the second learning objective, what is DNA? It is the blueprint for the body. So the DNA is a template which informs or thereby makes uh, processes come and take the DNA and they make amino acids. Which, when amino acids are chained together, they make proteins. And proteins are, from, are inside cells, which make tissues and organs, systems, which make us and other organisms. DNA is really cool because it's unique to every single organism. Unique to not just every organism, but every, especially for us humans, every single human has this unique, the, uh, unique sequence of A's, T's, C's, and G's. So you are very special. You are the only one you. So, how do we uh, go on to how do we detect DNA? Okay. So, what happens is that we're going to uh, we're going to amplify DNA using something called polymerase chain reaction. Have you guys heard of PCR before? No. All right, I'll take that as a no. <laughs> polymerase chain reaction. What that does is it is it takes your DNA, and so what happens is that you only have one small strand of DNA. It's easier to tell if you have, if you can, it's easier to detect DNA if you have a million strands of DNA than if you have one. And so what we're going to do is we're going to amplify it using this thing called PC, this technique called PCR. What PCR is, you have different heat zones. You've got 90 something degrees, 60 something degrees, and 70 something degrees. And what happens is that you've got one strand of DNA, and it goes, it goes to this chamber, you take these, uh, you raise up to 90 degrees, and as we know, that DNA is double helix. It's, it's two strands complementary to each other. And what happens when you raise it to 90 degrees, it falls apart. It like disconnects. And then when you bring the temperature down to 60 or 64 degrees, you've got things called primers. 
primers come and they have a specific A sequence of A, T, C's, and G's that bind to the DNA that you have. But it only binds if it's the DNA that you're looking for. In our case, TB, tuberculosis DNA. So if it finds tuberculosis DNA, these primers will come and attach to it. Then you raise the temperature up to 7 degrees, you have these proteins called, en uh, called these enzymes, proteins called polymerases, which come and make copies, uh, like complementary copies of the DNA. And so what happens is that you go from one piece of DNA, you go through the cycle of 90, 60, 70, you come out with two pieces of DNA. And then you do that again, the cycle, you come out with four pieces of DNA, and again you come out with eight. And so you can see it's, it's exponential in this case. It's the power of two. And so you can think about it as you can go from one strand of DNA to like a million strands of DNA, or a couple thousands of strands of DNA. And you can, it's easier to detect thousands of strands of DNA than it is to detect one. But, as I said, if the primer can't find that specific sequence on the DNA, it's not able to, it's not able, the polymerase comes, or the, the enzyme comes, it's not actually able to multiply, or not able to make complementary strand, complementary strand. So you can think of it like an on-off kind of situation, where you have, if you have your tuberculosis DNA, primer will come, and you amplify, and you make millions or thousands of deep pieces of the DNA. If you don't have your specific DNA that you're looking for, like tuberculosis, it won't. So after every cycle, you still have that same one strand of DNA. Now you probably think, how do we even detect whether or not you have a thousand strands of DNA? And you do that using molecular beacons. Uh, what molecular beacons are, is that it is a sequence of DNA of A, T, C's, and G's, which are complementary, which means they, they complement each other, they bind at its ends. And inside the middle, that's actually complementary, or it looks for the target DNA, which is your tuberculosis DNA. And so molecular beacons have these things called fluorophores, which like emit light, and quenchers, which absorb the light. And they're at the ends. And again, because the ends are complementary to each other, they bring, they physically bring a light emitting uh, molecule next to the quenching molecule. Whereby, when you look at their microscope, you can't actually see any light. But when you have the tuberculosis DNA that comes inside, it physically forces open this strand of DNA and it becomes linear, just like this. And that's where you have the light emitting side away from the quenching side. And then when you look at our microscope, you can actually see light. And so when this is inside the solution with the DNA when you're amplifying, you, when you look under it, you can actually see light. You see it start growing. You see like a small bit of light become brighter and brighter and brighter. With every passing cycle, it, it becomes more and more intense. It becomes brighter. And that's how you can tell we have <coughs> strands of uh, tuberculosis DNA, because it actually binds with that. Again, if the primers bind, you can find it. If you have tuberculosis DNA in there, then it amplifies to like thousands, and then you see it's really intense. But if it's not, then you won't see any, because the molecular beacons won't, will stay in this form, and there won't be any light. So the device that I create, or that I'm developing along with the team, we do that, we do that in these small types of chips right here. So I'm going to pass them around to the, on each table, you guys can take a look. Or actually, you guys can share that one. Oh, I only have enough for. Only have enough. So you guys are going to have to share this one. Pass that one. <laughs>